And in conclusion, Jar Jar Binks is definitely a Sith Lord. You've been talking about this for a whole week? Wait, you've been sleeping here for a whole week? Again, you've been talking about this for a whole week. Well, not the entire week. I was only talking about it last Tuesday and this Tuesday. In between then, I filed my taxes, I saved a man's life, I reopened the government, and I started a knitting club. And since you were sleeping through my whole explanation, this is why Jar Jar Binks is a Sith Lord. No, 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 no. Chapter one. No. Welcome back to The Real Deal, Ball State's premier entertainment news show. I'm your host, Abby Perry. And I'm Noah Bullard. We aren't lying this time. We finally hid the bodies of the pseudo-blonde hosts. Wait, I thought we agreed not to say that. What? Hiding the bodies? No, they're pseudo-blondes. Oh, I thought we weren't supposed to admit the crimes. It's not like we killed the comedian or anything. We weren't supposed to kill the comedian, too? Noah! I can't believe you've done this! What else did you do last week? Well, if you remember from earlier, I did my taxes, saved a man's life, reopened the government, started a knitting club, The Real Deal Knits, and helped Marcos with his segment on The Watchmen. Take it away, Marcos. It's been almost 10 years since the release of Zack Snyder's adaptation of Watchmen. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Watchmen reimagines the world in 1985 with superheroes and the Cold War about to explode, with Nixon as the president. Watchmen has long been held as one of the greatest stories ever written. There is so much praise for it that it is even one of the only graphic novels to make the Times Best 100 Best Novel list. Because of this, I was super stoked that HBO, the production company that oversees shows like Game of Thrones, Pretty Little Lies, and Westworld, were picking up a show adaptation of Watchmen, being produced and directed by Damon Lindelof. Now, according to recent reports, this adaptation won't be just a retelling of the source material, but rather an, an expansion on the foundation for the story that is already in place. The show will reportedly be taking place in a more contemporary setting, with figures such as Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, and Theresa May having some level of importance in the show, sort of as contemporary parallels to leaders during the Cold War. Due to the show taking place in a contemporary setting, Lindelof is looking to tell new stories with new characters, all while using the baseline that was laid by the graphic novel. Now, because I don't want to spoil anything, and I really can't go into it, having the show set in a contemporary setting will change up the dynamic of the material and the characters that fans love. I highly suggest that you go read the comic and maybe watch the film if the source material piques your interest. It's even on Netflix right now. So while there's not too much information known about this show, we do know that it is coming to HBO at some point during 2019. And along with it is a slew of talented actors to bring the characters in the series to life, including Oscar winner Jeremy Irons, Golden Globe winner Don Johnson, Regina King, and Francis Fisher, among others. Needless to say, with the amount of talent both behind and in front of the camera, this series is shaping up to be an exciting endeavor. Thanks for that killer segment, Marcos. You're welcome. Somehow I doubt you helped during that segment. Do you know who you're talking to? I'm the next Bachelor. Okay, you do know what they're calling you, right? No. Well, Mackenzie is here to tell us more about that. Take it away, Mackenzie. I know you were all waiting patiently for me to spill the tea on the new season of The Bachelor. And as the ABC phenomenon enters its 23rd season, it's become apparent that they were really reaching for a little something to spice things up. You know, because one man dating 30 women obviously just wasn't unique enough anymore. If you aren't familiar with the show, it's basically the ultimate dating show. One man is picked by ABC to be the face, and then 30 women are chosen to fight for his attention every week while going on the most extravagant dates you could possibly imagine and traveling the world. Each week, a couple of women are sent home until only two remain. At this point, The Bachelor gets down on one knee and asks one lucky girl to marry him, 
All 29 other girls are left crying in the back of limos on their way home. That being said, for a show that centers around unrealistically attractive people and fantasy suites, you can only imagine the shock that came along with the ABC's franchise's The Bachelor, announcing that their newest bachelor would be none other than Colton Underwood. The 27-year-old was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, and went on to become a professional football player, playing for the Oakland Raiders and Philadelphia Eagles during his career. But why talk about that when we could get straight into the more important details, like Colton being a 27-year-old virgin? Now, while this might not seem like news, it's quickly become his defining trait. Well, that and extremely nice arms. But it's also been almost the only thing that the 30 bachelorettes on the set have been able to talk about. From popping cherry balloons in his face on the first night and wearing a sloth suit to symbolize how he takes things slow, our bachelor's V-card seems to be the butt of all of their jokes. I kind of feel bad for the guy. I mean, good for him for putting up with the publicity of his privacy, but I don't think I could handle it. At this point in the season, I think the only person crying in a limo is Colton himself over all these Virgin Mary jokes. But I guess we'll see where the rest of the season takes us. Who are y'all rooting for? Thank you for that, Mackenzie. That was a spectacular segment. I'm going to forgive you for not mentioning my name. How did you get that gig anyways? I just, I didn't. Let a man dream. Did you even start a knitting club? Of course I did. You doubt my knitting greatness? Here, let me show you. Okay, well, while no one knits me a hat, let's see what movies are opening this weekend. Don't worry. They'll be here tomorrow. Or the day after tomorrow. Don't worry. <laughs> She's running out of time. I have to find help. I was 16 years old, and my father allowed me to go. I was just turned 17 at the time. I was 16, and I was 15 years. When they came to us, they were frightened children and had to be made into soldiers. Well, boys, here he comes. We're in the pictures. <laughs> I gave every part of my youth. Forget your friends. No one's coming to save you. Whether or not you survive, it's entirely up to you. You're gonna be my queen. You gotta learn how to use one of these. A bala, a bullet. A bala settles everything. Hit me like a Ever since you showed up, the police been one step ahead. You thought I was crocheting you a hat? I knit. I thought I made that very clear. Crocheting is Anastasia's department. I thought we took care of them. We did, but Anastasia came back. What? How? Is Tyler still dead? As a vampire. And of course he is. And he won't come back anytime soon. A vampire is talking about vampires? Whoa. In that case, take it away, Anastasia. Ever since the success of Guardians of the Galaxy, it seems Marvel was less scared to try lesser-known characters instead of sticking to the staples of Iron Man, Captain America, and Spider-Man. They started branching out, bringing Ant-Man, Doctor Strange, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and the Runaways to the screen. And it looks like they're going to tr take another chance on a new character that has yet to grace the silver screen, known simply as Morbius the Living Vampire. For those unaware of who Morbius is and weren't able to guess from his official title, he's a vampire. He originally appeared in a Spider-Man comic after the Comic Code's authority lifted the ban on supernatural creatures being in comics. Dr. Michael Morbius gained his blood-sucking tendencies not from being attacked by a va vampire, but instead from an experiment gone haywire. Morbius was a renowned biochemist who st suffered from a rare blood disease. In an attempt to save himself, Morbius developed a treatment using a combination of vampire bats and electroshock therapy. While this didn't turn him into an actual vampire, he gained a lot of the characteristics of one. Pale skin, an aversion to sunlight, the need to consume blood, flight, enhanced strength and speed and healing, as well as the ability to turn other people to be like him, a living vampire. He's battled Spider-Man on multiple occasions, 
but also has assisted him in several other heroes in his time, making him a tentative anti-hero. Morbius looks to be the title of the film and will be under the Sony contract with Marvel. Jared Leto will be playing the titular character, and Adria Arjona will be playing Martine Bancroft, a.k.a. Morbius's bride, and Matt Smith is connected to the film, but is, his character has yet to be revealed. Sony may be hoping to replicate the success of Venom with darker characters with a more complex view of what is right and wrong. Personally, I'm unsure of the casting of the film, with Jared Leto's frankly awful characterization of the Joker and Suicide Squad. I personally don't feel much hope for the film, even with how much I like the character. However, filming has yet to start and is scheduled for, the next, for next month, and the film is set to release July of 2020. Maybe as we get more information, we'll gain more hope as well. But that's it for me this go-around. I'm Anastasia Scott. Thank you, Anastasia. That segment was bloody fantastic. That's not funny. That is the least funny thing you told me. And earlier you said you started a knitting club. It's not funny, it's real. We get together every week, sit around in a circle, and talk about our feelings, and we knit. Who else is in the club with you? Well, there's Ethel, there's Gretchen, Gertrude. Oh, Gertrude's funny. Funny. Any of those people in the real deal? No. They're all in the real deal knits. Why would you think they're in the real deal? It's totally different, no relation at all. Shouldn't you have someone from the real deal be in it? You know what, fine. The next person who gives a segment is in the real deal knits. Amber, tell us your segment and you're in. So let's talk about Celebrity Big Brother. Celebrity Big Brother is a spin-off of Big Brother and it's currently in its second season. Big Brother is a reality game show that airs on CBS three times a week. Ever since 2000, the show has received phenomenal ratings and reviews. It has aired 20 seasons of the, as of the summer of 2018. It features a group of contestants referred to as house guests that live in a custom-built home house for three months. These house guests are locked in the house without any communication from the outside world. The house guests are competing for a $500,000 grand prize while being under 24-hour surveillance. In the house, the house guests make their own alliances to get them further in the game while competing in competitions. Every week, the house guests have to vote a person out of the house until there are only two people left. Half of the housemates, which are referred to as the jury, then votes one of those people to be the winner of the game. Last winter, CBS has rewarded us with a spin-off show called Celebrity Big Brother, in which all of the house guests are well-known celebrities. On January 1st, 2019, CBS has aired their second season of Celebrity Big Brother. This season features celebrities such as singer Tamar Braxton, Olympian Lolo Jones, pro wrestler Natalie Eva Marie, and many more popular celebrities. For the first five episodes that have already been backstabbing, lying, manipulation, and so much more drama with the house guests. It has been a lot of comedy due to some of the celebrity house guests not knowing how to play Big Brother. This has led to awestruck when the backstabbing was occurring. There has been screaming matches between some of the house guests, middle fingers being flicked, and a threat to leave the game altogether from not being able to handle the stress and the craziness of Big Brother. I have to admit, I was a little worried prior to the airing of this year's season because of the underwhelming premiere of the last season of Celebrity Big Brother. Super fans like myself wasn't used to most of the house guests not knowing how to play the game. I often find myself getting frustrated after seeing many stupid game moves being made. I was a little disappointed because I wasn't seeing the truest form of Big Brother that I was used to seeing with the regular season. This season, most of the house guests actually know how to play the game. With more game twists being implemented, the house guests will really have to expect the unexpected. Overall, Celebrity Big Brother is a very entertaining show to watch that keeps you on your feet every episode. Every episode is different and unpredictable. Thanks, Amber, for the great segment. It's got Noah in stitches. I'm going to ignore that and tell you about how well, it looks like we're going to take Noah to the hospital. I'm fine. I only stab myself with my knitting needles. Let's get you out of here. But before we do, shameless plug time. Let's see how Logan tortured his guests on his show, Rental Breakdown. Also, tune in next week for our live show, 8-Bit Chat. So the movie that we're doing today, everybody, is a little, a little movie called Nazis at the Center of the Earth. <sighs> Uh, as you know, we have a little, a little side thing where if we say buzzwords, we have to eat or drink something gross or something or whatever. And so, since it's super cold out, I thought we could heat it up a little bit. I'm okay with that. We got some 
really hot beef jerky. Oh my. Okay, so it's around the time when the Nazis are- Oh, buzzword. You knew that was gonna be a buzzword. I didn't. That's Why in did the title. Why did you say it? That's in the title. Okay. He does yeah. this all the time, remember? Ants? You realize she ants, as we all know. Oh, buzzword. Ants? Ants. Oh. Let's do it, bottoms up. A little spicy. <coughs> <coughs> a little spicy. <coughs> Is it spicy, Anastasia? <coughs> I'm dying! <coughs>Hey guys, I'm alive. No needles will kill me today. Unfortunately. But you drove me to the hospital. I thought you cared. That's my on-screen persona. Personally, I really don't care. Once upon a time, I thought you did care. Once upon a time, you didn't knit. You know what, I'm sick of this. Now on to Noah. Wait, is that right? There's another Noah. Angelo, Angelo, Michael! Here's my new favorite Noah with his segment. Noah? Thanks, Abby. As an avid fan of Quentin Tarantino, I've been looking forward to any news that's been released about his upcoming movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The movie is set to be released on July 26th this summer and stars Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt as a faded TV actor and his stunt double during the Helter Skelter of 1969. The film also features Margot Robbie as the doomed Sharon Tate, late wife to Academy Award winning director Roman Polanski, who you might know from The Pianist or Rosemary's Baby. Other former Tarantino cast members include Kurt Russell of The Hateful Eight, Tim Roth of The Reservoir Dogs, James Ramar from Django Unchained, and Michael Madsen from Kill Bill. And a little Easter egg I thought was worth mentioning, Damon Harriman, who plays Charles Manson in the Netflix original Mindhunter, will be reprising his role in this movie. Tarantino, who spent most of his life in LA, spent five years writing the script. He also met with Sharon's younger sister, Deborah, who wasn't a fan of the film at first, but then after having a conversation with him, she understood that his intentions of telling her sister's gruesome story were pure. He also said that this is probably the closest film to Pulp Fiction that he's ever done, which my interpretation is that there will be a non-linear story. No matter how the story is going to be told, I know that I will love it. And as of now, there hasn't been a, a trailer released, but in the meantime, fans can enjoy Tim Tino's eight other movies. Are, aren't you going to thank him for a segment? I am not going to be replaced, especially not as the Real Deal Knits founder, CEO, Supreme Leader, the all-around star, and the Senate. Thank you, Noah, for your segment. You're welcome. No, the better Noah. You are not going to be in my acceptance speech. Acceptance into what? The real deal nits? Exactly. We got nominated at the Oscars. That is crazy. More on this mayhem. Here's Matthew. <sighs> oh, Oscar season. It's everybody's favorite time of the year where we all can come together and get mad about all of our favorite movies getting snubbed and forgotten by the always wonderful Academy. I could give a three hour rant just about how Tony Collette and Ethan Hawke's submissions are an absolute travesty to the world, but instead of talking about my thoughts on the nominations, I'm taking this time to rant about the Academy themselves. Here's a quick rundown about where we are. Over the last few years, the Oscars viewership ratings have been dropping dramatically, with last year's broadcast hitting a record low for the program. Of course, the Academy and ABC have taken notice and have been trying to figure out the problem. So you'd think it would focus on tackling the countless scandals and controversies that have risen out of Hollywood and work on becoming more self-aware, or even the fact that cable television is falling victim to streaming services. Well, you'd be wrong. Earlier last year, the Academy announced that they would be introducing a new category that would rival the best motion picture called the Best Popular Movie Award, which is pretty much the equivalent of, your movie wasn't good enough to be nominated for Best Picture, but people would be mad if we didn't honor you, so here's a nice little participation trophy just in case we did something. Obviously, there's a lot wrong with that idea, so the Academy rightfully threw that away and pretended like nothing happened. A little further down the road, the Academy announced that after a long and exhausting process that Kevin Hart would host the 91st Academy Awards. And that news lasted for like half a day when the Academy announced that after a long and exhausting process that Kevin Hart was stepping down from hosting after he refused to apologize for some homophobic comments he made a few years ago. Now to be fair, this is more of a fault on Hart's ignorance rather than the Academy. But then the Academy decided to turn away any good that could have come out of this and made the decision to not have a host this year and instead depend on the usual celebrity banter to carry its show. 
Because you know everybody's favorite part of the Oscars has always been when the two actors stand together and read awkward dialogue off the teleprompter. Now, not having a host to, to tie everything together will cause the program to lose cohesion, but at least the Academy is staying on brand. And on top of all of this dumpster fire, they've also decided that the decline in viewership numbers is because of its runtime. So this year's Oscars will be dramatically shorter than previous years, which means that categories will be cut from the show and presented during commercial breaks. Now, from an establishment that is literally all about movies, they're acting like they really don't care. Now, I, long, I know this was a really long rant, but after many years of personally loving the Oscar season and watching the show, this is the first time that I cannot wait for this to be over. I'm really disappointed in what the Academy has done, but I guess I shouldn't be expecting anything more from the group that put up a film with a known sexual predator in the director's chair for Best Picture, especially after the Me Too movement. Let's just get this madness over with. Thanks, Matthew, but I didn't hear you mention the real deal nits. Just drop it already or I will make you drop it. I just want us to be appreciated. Noah, it's not a real club. You know what is appreciated? Movies and the money that they have made. Here are some now. We'll be back with our final words, jerk. We almost got you, bro. That live in that body with you. The beast is coming any minute now for you guys. But what I am questioning is your belief that you are something more than human. All of these to the right. Oh my God. They're not practical. Exactly. You can have any girl you want. What about this lady with all the bow ties? I'll be perfect for each other. You can't move your body, she can't move her face. I have no leader. I came because I have no choice. I came to save my home and the people that I love. You think you're unworthy to lead because you're of two different worlds. The second season of Friends from College recently came out. I got notified on Netflix about the release and went to watch it. I started the season and realized that I remembered nothing from the first season. I had to basically start all over with characters remembering the plot, but I'm curious as to why that is. Every time I get wrapped up in a show, I remember every detail while I anticipate the next season. If Orange is the New Black or The Ranch were to come out with a new season right now, I would remember what happened in the season finale. For some reason, I did not have any memory of friends from college at all, though. Now, this isn't to say that I didn't like it. In fact, I think the show is funny and has an interesting storyline. The friends are becoming close again several years later, and there's a lot of secrets and love triangles coming up. A pretty interesting idea for a show. Drama, different couples to root for, dysfunctions, and all the other juicy stuff. So I like it, a lot. I've been watching the second season and trying to remember the season one, and I have enjoyed this process. But again, if I like it so much, why can't I remember anything about it? Here's the hard truth. It's another attempt at a basic show about a gr group of quirky friends living in New York City. These friends each have really defining qualities and have crazy things happen to them in the big city. Sound familiar? Well, it should. Friends, How I Met Your Mother, and several other shows have the exact same idea. Exaggerated characters living in New York and unrealistic living spaces given their money situations coming together to get through all of the hard times. The difference? The characters don't all love each other endlessly. There's a lot of drama and cheating and lying and just not healthy friend things. The unhealthy friend things make the characters less, well, likable. With all the drama and six friends, it's hard to keep track of everything. All of the stories are separate, yet together, and it all gets jumbled as you watch. It's hard to keep track of what all is happening because so much is happening. While it is a funny show and it has a good storyline, I honestly wish I waited until after the second season came out to start watching all of it. The gap allowed for so much information to just wash away, and that makes everything more confusing. I know if I watched both the seasons now and then waited for the third, I'd feel the same way. We live in a world where shows are coming back and the remakes of the same ideas are coming about. Although we tend to enjoy this as viewers, it certainly does hurt the newer shows when they have to be compared to their counterparts. So, yes, Friends from College is great, but it's not better than How I Met Your Mother, and it's nowhere near better than Friends. If they changed the story, I wouldn't have to say such harsh things. Maybe writers and producers will catch on to this and bring us fresh, memorable content. But hey, the show's funny, so give it a watch for fun. Now here's Noah with something other than his knitting club. Yeah, after last week's Sith Lord rant, I was really struggling to come up with something to talk to you guys about tonight. 
However, Marvel decided to drop a gem of a season in their newest addition to the Punisher series. And while other Netflix-based Marvel shows have seen cuts, cancellations, the Punisher managed to eke out a final MCU Netflix season before all of your Marvel shows move over to Disney+. Daredevil, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist all saw their ultimate demise in the past year. 2019 has already seen the release of the newest season of The Punisher, and while I'd love to assure you that there will be more Punisher, Daredevil, and Iron Fist, once the MCU makes that transition to Disney+, Plus, I can't. So I'm going to tell you right now to get caught up before it's too late. The Punisher Season 2 begins in the immediate aftermath of Frank Castle's blood war with Billy Russo and Dina Madani. We're immediately treated to the mental hell that Billy Russo goes through as he becomes Jigsaw. He's the Punisher's comic book antagonist. While Russo struggles to remember why he feels so much pain, Madani tries to cope with her own PTSD via alcohol and prescription pain medication. Castle is on the lam after Homeland Security gives him one last shot at freedom, and he doesn't know about Russo's recovery. It's in a bar in Michigan, though, when it all turns south, and Castle is compelled to help a devious teenager that's in over her head. And the second season of The Punisher brings back the same angry Frank Castle we came to love early on, but it develops him into a character that shows more compassion towards strangers. Overall, season two of The Punisher is more well-written, emotionally charged, and it's an addendum that's perfect to the end of the first season. I give it a three and a half out of five. Well, until then, if you want more from us here at The Real Deal, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and our website for all things entertainment. I'm your host, Abby Perry. And I'm Noah Bullard. We'll see you the next time on The Real Deal.